Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And we're in the middle of a very interesting series on the book of Jeremiah. That's one of the huge books in the Old Testament. And in this lesson, we're going to hear about Jeremiah's yoke. Hmm. This is lesson number nine in that series for November 28 of 2015. And we're going to need some help in understanding this, so we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our Father, we come before you now with a humble desire to understand the terrible situation in which Jeremiah was living and the opposition he faced, etc. We wonder if something like that could ever happen again, even in our day. Give us wisdom to understand it is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. In this lesson, we're going to discover that Jeremiah not only preached messages, he not only presented messages, but sometimes he had to do what? Actually sort of live out his prophecies. And we'll see in the ways, the different ways in which he's doing that. By the way, could any of us ever have to live out a prophecy in our day? What do you mean by that? Well, here's a verse that we can think about. Luke 9, 23. And he said to them all, Anyone who wants to come with me must forget self, take up their cross every day and follow me. Could that happen in our day? We, we wouldn't be out there carrying a cross, surely, would we? Well, it has a figurative side to it. Yeah. <coughs> so wh why, what's the point of that question? I'm trying, <laughs> well, <laughs> trying well, to understand. Listen to the rest of the lesson and then maybe it'll okay. be more obvious. While he was still a young man, Jeremiah was told that he must not marry or have children. He was not to participate in either mourning ceremonies or celebration feasts. By, His life was... By being told, who told him? God. God, God okay. told him. All right. His life was to be a stark and lonely parable. And look at this. Jeremiah 16, we're not going to have time to read all 13 verses. Again, the Lord spoke to me and said, Do not marry or have children in a place like this. I will tell you what is going to happen to the children who are born here and to their parents. And um, what was the answer to that? They're all going to... Oh, sir. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was going to ask a side question, so maybe we better get an answer to your question first and then... Okay, well, we're going to do a little side thing here, too, so go ahead with your well, side thing. We're... What we're encountering here right off the bat is Jera's, Jeremiah's life is somehow going to be some kind of a metaphor. Mm -hmm. This sounds very strange, but it seems in and about this time there were other people, usually prophets. Or at least who, people who, who claimed to be prophets. Right, who, who had similar experiences. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of one who was, is it Hosea? who was before that, wasn't he told to marry a prostitute yeah. and, mm -hmm. and his life was supposed to be and didn't mm -hmm. Ezekiel have some time yeah. he, he had to live? What, what, what was this? F is there a well, reason think, for think this? Of, think or about or this. Why, <coughs> why, would, why would someone do some of these things? You mean why would Jeremiah? Well, why I know why Jeremiah, Jeremiah why he did it. Why did Hosea do that? Like, well, they were told to do it. As a lesson to the people, as, a, as an illustration. Do you, think, do you think his neighbors or his friends or anybody around town said, what in the world are you doing? Well, but my yes. question is, why this, why this mode of preaching? I don't know if we have it. I mean, that's what they're doing. Why, why this unusual method of, of, of these people I, I, going I, through these these yes. strange motions and poor old Jeremiah's going to, his life is going to be, you know, kind of well, destitute and... Yeah. It had a practical side. He told them all, well, God told him, they're all going to die. So at least the rough life he was leaving, leading, rather, and they, they gave him all kinds of trouble, but at least he wasn't going to lose his family. He didn't yeah. have one to lose. Yeah. Well, I, I think there's another reason. And I, I still don't understand this, why it's like this. But why didn't God, back in when they built the sanctuary in the desert, prepare a big classroom for teaching purposes? Mm -hmm. 
Why didn't they? Now, we have the, the schools of prophets are mentioned from the days of Samuel, but that's several hundred years right, later. Right. So, you know, they had, that's had some influence, but there's no place to, to go and preach in the temple courts. Now, Jesus did in, I mean, in, in this, what we call the second, the second temple period in, in Herod's court, he expanded that, that temple huge. And so there are places you go over on the side mm -hmm. and, and preach and so forth like that, but there's no place to preach inside the, the, uh, the, you know, the temple itself. Mm -hmm. So where do you preach? Well, these guys are preaching by walking down the street with carrying yokes mm -hmm. around their neck. Maybe the, maybe the, the original forms, maybe the, the candlestick was designed to preach. Mm -hmm. Maybe people weren't listening to that. Maybe they needed something, and I'm just ruminating here, as a, kind of trying to get an answer to my own question, but yeah. maybe they needed uh, something animated, so to speak, uh, yeah. an animated metaphor rather than maybe the stationary and, and they, static yeah. metaphors weren't working. Yeah. Well, that's their audio, audio visual yeah. system, is that they actually acted things out. Well, Jer Jeremiah was told not to marry. And what's the reason? Well, he was asked to, add, to live this very strict celibate life, which was very rare, even extreme, extreme in those days. And why was that? It was a hand-to-mouth existence, and they needed the manpower. Yes, that's, that's a major part of it. But to a Jew, one of the most important... I mean, think of the story of Abraham. One of the most important things you could do is, is, is have a son, and pass along to that son your heritage, right? <clears throat> and Jeremiah is being told, you're not going to have any heritage. Which is an analogy for what's going to have a di the southern kingdom, I guess, well, at this time. So here's the question. Would it be more painful to remain single or to marry and have children then see something terrible happen to them? Or perhaps even not be able to care for them? Remember that Jeremiah lived through the siege of Jerusalem when for nearly three years they were surrounded by the troops from Babylon and things became so desperate that the people were eating their own dead children. <coughs> so what Excuse me. you're saying here is this wasn't necessarily a metaphor. It was just God knows there's going to be some rough times ahead and and it would be better if you were in this situation rather than, and I'm confused, it isn't a metaphor. Well, it's kind of like not a metaphor if it <coughs> teaches you that there's no future. Let me read to you Jeremiah 19.9. The enemies will surround the city and try to kill its people. The siege will be so terrible that the people inside the city will eat one another and even their own children. And I quote from Lamentations. Now, this is also written by Jeremiah. Look, O Lord, why are you punishing us like this? Women are eating the bodies of, their, of the children they loved. Priests and prophets are being killed in the temple itself. And so Jeremiah writes, in what God says to, to Jeremiah, I will tell you what is going to happen to the children who are born here and to their parents. So now, if you're telling someone not to marry and not to have children, the children will be your children and... The parents would be who? You. you. Okay? They will die of terrible diseases. No one will mourn for them or bury them. Their bodies will lie like piles of manure on the ground. Doesn't that sound exciting? They will be killed in war or die of starvation, and their bodies will be found for food for the birds and the wild animals. Now, wouldn't you like to have some children? We haven't changed much over the years, have we? It sounds like World War II. Well, just just think about it. If 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 he was able to marry and have children, well, then there wouldn't be any real push behind what he's saying because it, it looks like he's not really believing or acting out what he's saying. So there's no future. Would well. Would you be happy to have a child and, 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 okay, now the child is growing up and your wife and you say, well, get ready, family. Some days your body is going to be lying out there in the dirt like piles of manure. Does that sound exciting? Would your children love to hear that message? You know, my aunt was in the 
an Adventist, and my grandma took him, took her to church, and she had a. There was a preach preacher preaching about the end times. It was going to happen any minute, mm -hmm. and she actually was impressed with that. Until afterwards, they got up and they talked about a building committee, and then she completely lost it. She walked out, never come back. Really. <laughs> well, <clears throat> Dr. Maxwell talks about his father, Uncle Arthur. Many people have read his stories. and Back when he was young, uh, they thought World War I was starting, and they thought the same thing. Well, you know, we're, we are on the brink of the Second Coming. And there were two couples trying to decide what to do. And one couple said, no, we really believe Jesus is about to come. We're not going to marry because of that. And Uncle Arthur said, you know, there's a verse in the Bible that says, occupy till I come. That's right. Hold fast. And he married, and now his grandchildren are about to die. <laughs> well, perhaps Jeremiah's solitary life was also supposed to warn the children of Israel of the difficult times that were coming when they would lose so much not only materially, but also family and friends, etc. Jeremiah had only the Lord to depend upon. Then again, isn't the Lord the only one who is utterly reliable? We can always count on Him. Well, then there was a very interesting incident occupying really two chapters, Jeremiah 27 and 28. Soon after Josiah's son Zedekiah became king of Judah, the Lord told me to make myself a yoke out of leather straps and wooden crossbars and put it on my neck. Then the Lord told me to send a message to the kings of Edom, Moab, Ammon, Tyre, and Sidon to their ambassadors who had come to Jerusalem to see King Zedekiah. So let's picture what's going on here. So welcoming the new king. And, probably. And probably plotting how are we going to get away from Babylon. As Babylon has already conquered Jerusalem once. Daniel and his friends have been taken off into Babylonian captivity, and they're over there in the university somewhere as this conference is going on. So, what, 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 was, what do they want to hear? What do those people want to hear? <coughs> Guess what, folks? You got 70 years of slavery coming up ahead of you, or captivity anyway? Who wants to hear that? Who wants to hear that you're going to lose your home, you lose all your property, your family, all your possessions? Well, here's an interesting note from one commentary. As a faithful and true prophet of Yahweh, Jeremiah often stood alone among the religious leaders of his day and his countrymen. And there's some references, Jeremiah 26 and 27. And even among his family and in the city of his birth, Jeremiah 11 and 12. His life truly exemplified the statement of Jesus, a prophet is not without honor except in his own country and his own house. Remember that Jeremiah was born and raised in a small town, which is how far from Jerusalem? About three miles. About three miles. Well, verse 2, Jeremiah 27, verse 2. I was told to make a, myself a yoke out of leather stops and a wooden cross and to put it on my neck. We already looked at that verse very briefly. And one of the more incredible stories in this lesson, Jeremiah was asked to actually make a yoke out of wood with leather straps and put it on his own neck in order to give his message to either the kings or their ambassadors from surrounding nations who had come to meet with the new king Zedekiah. The text is a little confusing. It is possible that Jeremiah was asked even to make yokes for all the ambassadors or the kings themselves who had come. So he probably hauled in a whole bunch of yokes, if that's the case. Awesome, and yeah. And said, I've got mine on, here's yours. Yeah, exactly. And well, what's the meaning of a yoke? I mean, when you saw someone walking down the street with a yoke on his neck, what would you think? A touch of insanity these days. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. but the, it means they had a burden, or a burden was coming that they couldn't get rid of, like oxen, unless it was taken off. Yeah. Well, look at Deuteronomy 28, 48. So then you will serve the enemies that the Lord is going to send against you. You will be hungry, thirsty, and naked in need of not everything. The Lord will oppress you harshly 
un uh, uh, until you are destroyed. And the expression, you are, the Lord will oppress you harshly, put a yoke on you. Look at 1 Kings 12, verse 4. Your father Solomon treated us harshly, put a yoke on us, and placed heavy burdens on us. If you make those, these burdens lighter and make life easier for us, we will be your loyal subjects. And of course, he wasn't ready to do that. So these verses clearly imply that these people intended to, you know, really, the Babylonians are going to come and, and, and treat them very unfairly. Beat up on them. Our adult Bible study guide says, and I'm not quite sure how they got this information, that this yoke was one and a half meters long and eight centimeters thick. That would be five feet long, about yay so, and eight centimeters thick would be about something like that. So three inches. Probably made out of oak. Yeah. <laughs> Try to imagine yourself approaching the king and his very honored guests, some of them perhaps kings themselves, wearing a yoke and telling them that soon they would be doing the same. Try to imagine that. You know, maybe if you walked up and you just preached to them and pointed your finger, it just wouldn't have the effect that this visual did. Well, the other side of that, and you're right, I, I absolutely agree with you, but there's another side to that. Remember that Jeremiah was living in a time when it was not uncommon for a king to order anyone bringing unwelcome news to be killed on the spot. Yeah. Yeah. Think of the story of Esther. If I perish, I perish, right? Well, and as you discussed last week when you talked about uh, Manasseh, mm -hmm. when they were hauled away, when they were defeated and hauled away, a king was hauled away, um, it was a very unpleasant experience. They could kind of be, maybe find themselves or picture themselves in this yoke being hauled across the desert off the way to, to Babylon. I have a question for you now. This is a, something to think about. We see now nations rising and falling and fighting and carrying on and so forth, and Babylon comes up and he conquers all these nations. Do you think God has anything to do with all of that? He lets it happen. He lets, he lets it happen. It happen. Yeah. Unfortunately, or at least well, the Bible's written many times, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that to you. Mm -hmm. Because if he said it, if you aren't careful, this is going to happen to you, and these are going to come, people would, would not pay that much attention. So he's got to raise his voice, I think. Yeah, not but, only that, how often were, for example, the kingdom of, of Babylon mentioned by name? Right, exactly. By his prophets. Yeah, yeah. He said, these people are coming. But if so God you is don't our... think that he was, that God did raise them up for discipline on them? That, that it was That was my just, question. That human it was nature, just natural? Human I mean, nature tends to go toward paganism and go, tends to go toward uh, violence. Mm -hmm. That's the way human nature left to run its course, unchecked. So, and if God is our protector, he doesn't have to, th ultimately, he doesn't have to threaten you. It's another way of looking at it. It's, but but it, would, it would sound like he's not really in control if he, that's if right. he said that, well, these guys are People just are coming in. I'm sorry, I can't do anything about it. Yeah. You yep. know? Yeah. No, he could do something about could, it, but it, there's the element of freedom. That's it. Shoot. My freedom. The, the Babylonians well, my freedom. My point, though, is <coughs> that free will, you know, he's backing off and saying that I can't do anything about it because of freedom, choice, and all that. The then freedom right. starts becoming kind of helter-skelter. How would you decide in that kind of a situation whether God was really in control at all? You need... Let's, well, let's he says he was. <laughs> okay, and, and, and well, what evidence would you have for that? We, we had evidence last week when we observe that God predicted a king by the name of Josiah was going to come. Yeah. Hundreds of years in advance. So and exactly if it, what he was going to do. That's right. So if he has control over that, then why is it he has control over that, but we're kind of, un when we're uncomfortable with 
there's well, other things that, well, no, no, that's, that's just the consequences of humans tinkering around, but in this application, God did, did have a direct effect. And what about the passage that says God sets kings up and he sets them down? Yeah. So we're about to see that God was directly involved with this whole story. He predicted 70 years of Babylonian captivity. Mm -hmm. He predicted the name of Cyrus mm -hmm. af in predicted the next the empire after that. So and yeah. But yet at the, the, at the same time, we say, well, all this comes about not because God was in control of these things, but because people were in control because of their lack of uh, faithfulness. Well, God said to Jeremiah, See if you believe this directly. By my great power and strength, I created the world, the human race, and all the animals that live on the earth, and I give it to anyone I choose. I see there. So it, it is what he's saying there that I, I, I'm sending the Babylonians? I think so. I thought they came down there because the people were so bad that they're just later suffering we, the consequences of their later decisions. Later, one of the other prophets said, I, I allowed the Babylonians to come down there, but they did a lot more worse stuff than I had planned for them to do. Gordon looks like he is pregnant with a comment over there. <laughs> God allowed, what a way to put it. <laughs> God allowed these people to come. He no longer protected there you go. Judah from the onslaught of these kings. Oh, I man. think I don't I think he actually sent them down there. No. no. Why? Why not? Human nature will default go. toward paganism and toward violence and toward they cuz they're, they're self-centered. No, I know. God doesn't have to but do that, anything. It by default it will happen that way. He it's created not, them all. He's the protector. He created them all though. He is their protector. Well, and does he pr protect only part of the time? He'll protect it, unless you have chosen to go your own self-centered way. Okay, well, let's let's let's, let's look at shift. evidence. Let's look at evidence here. Does it give you hope to know that God is completely sovereign? You know, there, yes. there are those that talk about God's sovereignty, that, that God can do as he chooses. God cannot force you to love. We talk about his omnipotence. Uh, and, and look at the Gospels. Did Jesus threaten anybody? He warned them, if you continue this path, you will go to, to destruction. He used the word Gehenna. Isn't, isn't yeah. that right? Okay. Was he threatening them or warning them? And in Genesis 2, 2, was he threatening or warning if you eat the tree of knowledge of good and evil? Uh, warning. Many of our Christian friends think that God is so far above us that nothing we can do will affect him in any way. Do we have any evidence to the contrary? Well, the Bible clearly says that this is not the case. Look at Luke 15, 7, and it's also repeated in verse 10. In the same way I tell you, now these are the words of Jesus himself. In the same way I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 respectable people who do not need to repent. Does that tell us that what we do affects what goes on in heaven? Sure. Absolutely. Well, it's because there's consequences to what we do. Of course. There you go. <laughs> but the consequences are set up by God. No, you're not going to... He is, he's put the truth together, and when you go against the truth, it'll come at you. That's the but way it, it is. Not, he sends it when you go against the truth. Because he set it up that sin way. Sin pays its wage, <laughs> not God pay it, doing it to you. Sin okay. pages its ways, pays its pays wage. A, pays Romans its wage. 6, well, that's good. But who set it up that it gets paid? That's, that's the problem well, of love. So what you're, you're, what you're talking about then is the ultimate sovereignty of God. Because you're saying he set it up that way. He set it up that way, right. How else, right. Would, how else could he have done it? If, if God is love, how else, other way could he have set it up? Well... You can't have love unless you have hate. I mean, I mean that's choice. that's yeah, how you choice. tell the difference. It's choice. Okay, well let's let's, let's carry on because we're going to see this all illustrated right here in the book of <laughs> our story for this week. Really Jeremiah approached these high-level officials at the palace, and Ellen White makes these words comments this this comment: the amazement of the assembled council of nations knew no bounds when Jeremiah, carrying the yoke of subjection around his neck about his neck, 
made known to them the will of God. I mean, imagine someone today walking into Congress or walking into the United Nations with a yoke on their neck and saying, this is what's going to happen to all of you in the near future. And it's the will of God. And it's the will of God. Well, maybe we ought to try that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we ought to be careful. Not. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Safety you know, being don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, look what happened. That same year, look at chapter 28, that same year, in the fifth month of the fourth year that Zedekiah was king, Hananiah, son of Azur, a prophet from the town of Gibeon, spoke to me in the temple. In the presence of the priests and of the people, he told me that the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, had said, I have broken the power of the king of Babylonia. Within two years, I will bring back to this place all the temple treasures that King Nebuchadnezzar took to Babylonia. I will also bring back the king of Judah, Jehoiachin, son of Jehoiakim, along with all the people of Judah who went into exile in Babylonia. Yes, I will break the power of the king of Babylonia. I, the Lord, have spoken. All the people said amen. Why not? How are, they to know the, how are they to know the difference? One well, prophet says one thing and one prophet says another. Exactly. Then in the presence of the priests and of all the people who were standing in the temple, I said to Hananiah, Wonderful! I hope the Lord will do this. I certainly hope he will make your prophecy come true and bring back from Babylonia all the temple treasures and all the people who were taken away as prisoners. But listen to what I say to you and to the people. The prophets who spoke long ago before my time and yours predicted that war. Now, okay, how many of us can fix the prophecies that were made before we were born? Not humanly possible. Can fix them? They, huh? You mean make them come about? You, you, can't, you can't force somebody back 100 years ago to make a prophecy for you so now you can fulfill it. Oh, okay. So he, the war, war was predicted, starvation was predicted, disease would come to many nations and powerful kingdoms. But a prophet who predicts peace by, can only be recognized as a prophet whom the Lord has truly sent when that prophet's predictions come true. Right? Mm -hmm. Well, Deuteronomy 18, 21 and 22 says something about that. You may wonder how you can tell when a prophet's message comes, does not come from the Lord. If a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord and what, it, what he says does not come true, that's not the Lord's message. That prophet has spoken on his own authority and you are not to fear him. Well, how are you supposed to respond to that? We have, in this case, a prophet who says one thing and another prophet who says something else. Mm -hmm. And we're assuming that the prophet is telling you so that you can prepare or what have you, but you don't know which one to follow until their prophecy comes to fruit. So yeah. how okay. are you supposed to? Here's a, uh, uh, let me make the problem even worse. Well, one good. Of the, one, of the prophets, <laughs> one of the prophets is saying something that everybody hopes will happen, even the other prophet sure. hopes will happen. Sure. But the other prophet is saying something that nobody wants to hear. Right. Now, who are they likely to believe? The one that does nice things that tickle their ears. Yeah. But what, what, so all I what, have to do is just go out and speak something bad. Then I must be a good prophet. What, no, what? only if it comes true. But only if it comes true, but I'll be speaking something bad, so you'll... Of what <laughs> use is it to even listen to them if uh, you, 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 you don't know which one to follow yeah. until the calamity has already yeah. come? Just go with a bad guy, and that way you'll be in good sh Go with yep. Jeremiah, because then no matter what happens, if it turns it's, out good, you're still going to be... It, you know, you're asking a very valid question. Look what Ellen White says about Jeremiah, Prophets and Kings, page 445. Because everybody else has the same question. Jeremiah, in the presence of the priests and people, because this happened right in the temple, earnestly entreated them to submit to the king of Babylon for the time the Lord had specified. He cited the men. Jeremiah has already predicted that it's going to be 70 years. So this is after that. Okay, He cited the men of Judah to the prophecies of Hosea, 100 years before, Habakkuk, which was happening right then, Zephaniah, which was happening right then, and others whose messages of reproof and warning had been similar to his own. 
He referred them to events which had taken place in fulfillment of prophecies of retribution for unrepented sin. In the past, the judgments of God had been visited upon the impenitent in exact fulfillment of his purposes, a purpose as revealed to his messengers. Well, this is exact reason not to believe Jeremiah because other prophets had preached this, as you say, mm -hmm. hundreds of years, years before, and it hadn't happened. So Jeremiah is just another, just, uh, Jeremiah is just another one of those guys that's saying this calamity is going to come they've been preaching about for millennia here. And it hasn't uh, happened. Not millennia yet. Well, well, all right. Long time. Half a millennia. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so, what's a guy to do? Yeah, that's the question. Well, and he, this Jeremiah isn't the only one who faced this problem. Well, you got to admit the 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 two year prophecy didn't really fit with anything except uh, it was a feel good prophecy. Yeah. And uh, the other one. He actually sewed him into the other prophecies, and that would give you some evidence that, yeah. hey, you better be listening to what I say. So. The problem gets even worse. Yes. <laughs> In Deuteronomy 13, <laughs> 1 to 3, prophets or interpreters of dreams may promise a miracle or a wonder in order to lead you to worship and serve gods that you have not worshipped before. Even if what they promise comes true, do not pay any <laughs> attention to them. The Lord your God is using them to test you to see if you love the Lord with all your heart. See, there proves my point. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, what's, what's, what does that passage tell us? Is it time to change gods? No. No matter what happens, good or bad, it's not. You know, if, if someone comes along and tells you to worship a different god, so don't was this, it. wasn't this prophet the two year prophet? Wasn't he, didn't he, um, he claimed wasn't to be he speaking for Jehovah. Okay, mm -hmm. so that wouldn't, your point wouldn't be valid there because uh, he's not from a different God, though. No, no, it, the, as far as De Deuteronomy 13. It yeah. could be having two de very different pictures of God. Yeah. No. So, uh, so I guess let's what I'm trying to point out is, is yeah. how it would be difficult to know yeah. Which exactly. one to believe? Well, and your turn is coming. Just hold on. <laughs> <laughs> then Hananiah took the yoke off my neck, broke it in pieces, and said in the presence of all the people, the Lord has said that this is how he will break the yoke that King Nebuchadnezzar has put on the neck of all the nations, and he will do this within two years. Then I, and Jeremiah is talking here, then I left. What else, you know? What do you do next? I wonder if you saw all this, how would, what, what side would you pick? Mm -hmm. um, you know, Jeremiah comes in with the yoke, and that's really kind of a strange thing, and he's got this bad news, and then this other prophet takes it and dramatically breaks it, mm -hmm. and says, "This is all baloney." Mm -hmm. You know, so how would you? How? Well, I will. I, I will give you some clues now. Let's 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 make the the plot. Let's make the plot thicker. Okay, it's it's more trouble. <laughs> Matthew twenty four. Jesus is standing in the temple courtyard. This is Herod's temple, which was two three times as big as Solomon's temple. Gorgeous. They had been spent. They had spent forty six years trying to build up this temple, and Jesus is just walking away with his disciples. And says. Not one stone of this temple is going to be left on top of another one. And they're going, huh? And so they walk across the valley and up the Mount of Olives, and they're sitting there watching the sun go down, and they said, Jesus, tell us, how is this going to happen? I mean, how could that be possible? And Jesus said, this is how the stones are going to be thrown down? No, he doesn't say that. He says, be on your guard. I'm reading Matthew 24, verses 4. I'm going to read three or four passages here from Matthew 24. Be on your guard and do not let anyone deceive you. Is that what we're talking about? Deception? Mm -hmm. Many men claiming to speak for me will come and say, I am the Messiah, and they will deceive many people. And then I'm going to drop down to verse 11. Then many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. What time is he talking about? Presumably our time. Our time. Definitely. Our time. Yes, 
Well, Drop down to verse 23. Then if anyone says to you, look, here's the Messiah, or there he is, do not believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear. They will perform great miracles and wonders in order to deceive even God's chosen people if possible. Listen, I've told you this before the time comes. Okay, Jay, you've been warned. Is that why it's important to have the most clear picture of God you can? So if somebody tells you the Messiah's over here or over here, don't believe them, right? Why would you say, why do you know that? How do you know that? Well, you just read it. I, I, I know, but I'm saying, okay. What else? Th there's there's, there's well, very specific. Every eye there, will see him. Yeah. It's Revelation 1-7. There's, there's another thing, though. When Jesus rose, he told the disciples to meet him over at such and such place. Yeah. So, in a way... Isn't he kind of doing what he said isn't going to happen? No. no because no, he's no. telling them that I will be over here. So, and then the people would go, then other people would tell their buddies that Jesus said he's going to be over here at this time. When Jesus comes the second time, because that will be after the close of probation well, and all that. Okay, but are you saying that this is talking about the second coming? That's exactly yeah. what his disciples were asking about. That's what they were asking about. They okay. weren't asking about meeting him in, Jer in, in Galilee. So, if, if somebody specific. says the Messiah is over here, but it's not the second coming yet, yeah, then, would that be okay? <laughs> well, it's okay, but you, I, you wouldn't, shouldn't bother to go over there and listen to him. Well, Why not? Because the Messiah, when the Messiah comes, the entire sky is going to be full of brilliant, shining angels. And the devil will never be allowed to imitate that coming. Okay, but so he did if come you, after You say, me. if someone says, well, Jesus is right over there, he's come back, you say, I don't see any shining angels, I'm sorry. All but you have to do. I'm, I'm talking about right after the resurrection. I'm now, if somebody about, tells oh, okay. him, no, but you can't do that by reading that. I guess I can. You How can you? Tied in with other prophecies. He's, he's, yeah, he's, he's talking. The disciples are asking, I mean, Jesus wasn't saying the temple is going to be destroyed by the time I get to Galilee. They're talking about, they thought that the, that the temple would not be destroyed until the second coming. So you're saying that's that's talking in context of the temple. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's but exactly it didn't what, come. That's what they asked. He didn't come after the temple was destroyed. Well, and, and why why didn't he? He didn't he wanted them to he wanted them to think in, in, in a little bit longer terms, but he didn't dare to, I mean what if he had said to them, Well, I think I'll come back about two thousand years from now. Well yeah but yeah. I, we're not getting anywhere to my point, but yeah. that's so. So these people in Jeremiah's time, were, what were they supposed to do with this message? Yeah. Were they supposed to, uh, I don't know, panic or go hide or do something, or were they supposed to, as we discussed a couple of minutes ago, occupy till I come yeah. or Nebuchadnezzar comes? Or is there a parallel to okay, well, to if you, to if you modern had been times? Jeremiah, what would you have done? If I were Jeremiah, what would I have done? Well, I guess I'd have hung around with them, but then Nebuchadnezzar came. Okay, here's and, the sequel and tried to the story. To stay out Sometime of after this, the Lord told me to go and say to Hananiah, the Lord has said that you may be able to break a wooden yoke, but he will place it with, replace it with an iron yoke. The Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, has said that he will put an iron yoke on all these nations and that they will serve the, the king Nebuchadnezzar of Babylonia. The Lord has said that he will make even the wild animals serve Nebuchadnezzar. Is that the end of the message? Was, uh, was this false prophet, did he really believe this or is he just... That's a good question. Is he just trying to get, Can I you, don't know, whatever he would be try, someone would be trying to get in when this a, when a false <laughs> When the false messiah finally comes, will he really believe that he's the messiah? Well, there's lots of false messiahs. There I'm were lots about of about the, the ultimate one. Probably. Well, that's he wants different. us to think he's the ultimate messiah. Self-deception, maybe. 
He is a master of self-deception. So this false prophet in Jeremiah's day, he was looking for um, some kind of fame, some kind of glory, yeah. some kind yeah. of. He was he was playing the he was playing the the politically correct. I see. So when Jeremiah shows up and says, kind of on the sly here, to him in private, this is what's going to happen, and the, and it's because of your shenanigans here. Mm -hmm. Well, what's the final result? A few verses down, look at Jeremiah twenty-eight fifteen. Then I told Hananiah this and added, Listen, Hananiah, the Lord did not send you, and you are making these, these people believe a lie. And so the Lord himself says that he's going to get rid of you. Before this year is over, you will die because you have told the people to rebel against the Lord, and Hananiah died in the seventh month of that year. Would that be a clue? Now, did this message get out to the people, populace yeah. in general, or did yes. he just tell? Well, it's interesting. His, the false prophet gave it two years, but then God said that this is going to happen mm -hmm. to that prophet before that time mm -hmm. so that the people could then see who was telling the truth. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, Hananiah's message had had its evil effects already. They wanted to believe what Hananiah said. So instead of preparing themselves, submitting to Jehovah's counsel and surrendering to Babylon, they resisted to the point where Zedekiah was forced. And this is so sad. The last king, he, remember, he called Jeremiah, and they had this little conversation. And Jeremiah said, please, just go out and surrender to Babylon. Everything will be fine. This city will be preserved. Your life will be preserved. And what happened instead? He refused to go out. He was forced to see all his high officials and his family murdered before his eyes, and then to have his eyes gouged out. He died a short time later after being taken to Babylon as a blind man. That's a long trip. Blind. Blind. And a miserable... Miserable memories. Yeah. I, I would love to see their, their emotional level as they were listening to all this, you know, to see exactly what, what they were doing. Were they just not believing him, or were they just so angry that they wouldn't reason with themselves? To, to actually listen to what he was talking about. That's what I'd like to see. And I think that's gonna, what's going to be happening at the end of time. It's going to be more anger that's going to come up to cause all well, this stuff more than anything. Paul said some things about what, what's going to happen at the end. Let's look at his words. Second Timothy 4, starting with verse 3. The time will come when people will not listen to sound doctrine. That sounded a little bit like Jeremiah's day but will follow their own desires and will collect for themselves more and more teachers who will teach them what they are itching to hear. They will turn away from listening to the truth and give their attention to legends. So, But you must keep on and be faithful. But you know what? I think if anybody contradicted where they wanted to go, that they would get mad and upset. Mm -hmm. I think they would. They wouldn't yeah. be tolerant and say, oh, that's what you say, let's go this way. No, I think they would turn around and just start the kicking. The wicked him. one, now I'm looking at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9. The wicked one will come with the power of Satan and perform all kinds of false miracles and wonders and use every kind of wicked deceit on those who will perish. They will perish because they did not welcome and love the truth so as to be saved. So, what, it, what, kind, of, what kind of dangers are coming? The great controversy is all about who is telling the truth. Is it God or is it the devil? So if, if Satan comes down and starts doing these miracles, mm -hmm. and then somebody like you or me that know the Bible better, yeah. start contradicting him and saying that this is wrong, mm -hmm. I think the wrath will come yeah. from the anger of the people that want to believe that Absolutely. those other... There you go. The, Nobody, nobody's arguing with you. I the, hope you... They put you in a log and saw you in two. Yeah, maybe. Oh, my. 
<laughs> yeah. Satan will try in every way possible, especially at the end of this world's history, to imitate Jesus' manner of coming, his way of speaking, his ability to perform miracles, etc., in order to deceive, if possible, the very elect. We read the verse. Remember that what we're going to be going through is at least a, a second go around, or maybe a third or fourth, because war in heaven. Yeah. The war in heaven. And this earth was to answer, experience here was to answer the questions that were raised in How the war. How many lies from Satan are being preached from pulpits in this country and around the world every day? Yeah. You know what Jeremiah was preaching was treason. Yeah, of course. To give in to the enemy. Well, cooperate with the enemy. Do people talk about the immortality of the soul, ever-burning hell? Where did those ideas come from? Praying to saints? The, straight from the devil. That God is arbitrary, vengeful, unforgiving, and severe? How do we find out that those things are not true? There's no way except learning the truth from Scripture. Well, and the truth from Scripture, one is in Romans 3, 4. Mm -hmm. May you in your case when you are judged, talking about God, mm -hmm. but what does the NIV says, I hope you make the right judgment. I'm paraphrasing what they said. As, though, as if God is not always telling the truth, as God is not always going to judge correctly. But that, and then the people, that's their Bible. So they go home and they read that, it may be, and it says the opposite thing. So who, how do you get the truth out to the people? The only way to detect a counterfeit is to know, understand, and recognize the truth clearly and precisely. There's a very famous picture, as some of you might have seen it, documentary, about a man who was a fantastic counterfeiter. And they caught him and put him in prison, and finally he says, well, if, if you want me to help you, I will tell you how you catch counterfeiters. And he went to work for the government, worked for the, I believe, I believe it was the FBI he was working for. He was by far their best detector. He knew exactly all the tricks of the counterfeiters. So shouldn't we be doing that? You mean be, be a counterfeiter? No, tell them the truth. We, the need, counter, we need to the detect counterfeit. the counterfeit. Detect it. Yeah, but your illustration there, they were he was a counterfeiter. Well, but <laughs> he, he, he came he joined Converted the Converted counterfeiter. Converted. Oh, okay, so I'll, I'll do the Lord good by going out and doing evil, then be converted so I can tell well, everybody what the I evil like is. I like the conversion part. <laughs> well, unfortunately, and let's just go ahead, and I'm not trying to accuse anybody, but I'm just, I'm just putting the lies out there. Most of our Christian friends be, accept, who accept the Bible believe that the millennium, spoken of only in Revelation 20, will be a golden time when Jesus will come to this earth and reign in peace. Does it seem to you that we're moving in that direction? Or are we, as suggested by a number of passages in the Bible, moving toward a time of trouble, plagues, devastation, and destruction just prior to the second coming of Jesus? That's it, right. As it were, it's in the days of Noah, so will it be co the coming was, of the Son of Man. That was a golden time of peace, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Well, one of Jeremiah's important points in countering Hananiah's lies, Gary, here you go, was to point out that a number of previous prophets had given messages similar to one that Jeremiah was giving at that time. Compare the following messages, the small, the following message from Ellen White for us. We have nothing to fear for the future except that we, as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and his teaching in our past history. She stated that first by letter from Australia, sent to the General Conference, and included, they, they stood up and read it at the General Conference meeting, January 29 of 1893. She repeated it again, another letter, 18, Jan, February 20, 1899, and then it was in the Review and Herald in 1905. She repeated it again and again. What was she trying to say to us? We need to remember the history. You know, there's a lot of historians that have said the one thing we learn from history is we don't learn. We don't learn anything from history. <laughs> wow, there's been nothing wrong with the Lord way the Lord has led us in the past. What's been the problem? Our following. We're not following the Lord's leading, right? 
The problem was our following. We don't take the instruction back there in Deuteronomy. Yeah. Read the law from time to time. And, and even our memories aren't that good. That's so she wrote that because of what? People forgot. They forgot what the, the way the Lord had led them in the past. Is, is it because they were scared to death of something? Is that what they were... That, maybe that's for various reasons, talking. or maybe they just had poor memory. So they were scared to death. If they had a good memory, they'd know by what had the Lord had yeah. done in the past, and then they wouldn't be scared anymore. If, you care, if they had carefully learned from Scripture and from the earlier writings of Ellen White... They would have had some idea the way what the Lord wanted to lead them at that point in time. I think it makes oh, it's more powerful that statement when he talks about our lives, you know, as far as how yeah. God has led you, and then you come up to sure. times that are that are questionable, whether you scary or whatever. Ellen White's talking about her generation, people who grew up with her, and they weren't listening to her messages. Why do people reject the truth? Because some don't want it to be that way. Yeah. A lot of people reject the truth because they, they don't want it to be like that. For whatever reason, they don't want to believe that. Other people reject the truth because it doesn't fit with their current paradigm. The way of, you know, they have this way of organizing everything in their mind and someone comes along with an idea that seems clear out there and it just couldn't possibly be true. They just reject it out of hand because it doesn't fit. Sometimes the, tr the truth takes you into the unknown yes. and you don't want to uh, you don't want to relinquish control over you don't want to place your trust into you want to you want to keep control for some reason you don't trust mm -hmm. God to to handle that situation. Um you think the time will ever come when we will have <clears throat> to worry about our families like Jeremiah was told not to have wife and have children? Look at Luke 12, 51. I have a baptism, well, 51. Do, not, do you suppose that I came to bring peace to the world? No, not peace, but division. From now on, in the original it says a sword. From now on, a family of five will be divided. <clears throat> three against two and two against three. Fathers will, be against their son, fathers will be against their sons, sons against their fathers, mothers will be against their daughters, and daughters against their mothers. Mothers-in-law will be against their daughters-in-law, and daughters-in-law against their mothers-in-law. What does that well, sound like? Is that, is, that a, is that a prophecy telling you to be fearful at that time, or just to recognize that when this happens, it's, you know, it's just part of these... It's just going to happen, and don't be disoriented by it. Mm -hmm. Well, it sounds like the argument that people aren't getting along <laughs> doesn't mean that it's not from God. Yeah. Well, let's, let's just pick up another point from our lesson. Do you think there's any pastors or people in our day preaching sermons to itching ears? Itching ears? Yeah. yeah. What they ears want that hear. want to hear what they want to hear. <coughs> yeah. I, when a pastor speaks very bluntly and plainly, assuming he's speaking the truth, do we appreciate that? Or does that make us uncomfortable? I don't know. I don't recall hearing anything like that. <laughs> okay. Well, you're assuming that we're doing something wrong. <laughs> well, why would I assume that we at least aren't doing everything right? We're still here. We're still here. And well, the Lord knows when He's coming, so yeah, and we I, will come during that time. We're only 130 years and a few months since. Uh, or doesn't matter. Than doesn't than matter. He knows when he's going to come, and he's going to come during that time. Well, Jeremiah was told very early in his ministry, Jeremiah 1.5, that he would be a prophet to the nations. His wooden yoke prophecy was given to three different audiences at different times. First, it was given to Jehoiakim, somewhere between 609 and 605. 
B.C., just before the first conquest of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar. It was, a given again, it was given again to Zedekiah sometime around 594 B.C., and finally it was given to the kings or possibly their representatives from Edom, Moab, Ammon, Tyre, and Sidon. These nations surrounding Judah all tended to be hostile, and none of them wanted to hear or even to think of the idea that they might be conquered by Babylon. But what happened? They all were. Jeremiah's message so was... Jeremiah went out to these uh, foreign kings and said, look... Well, they came. They came to Zedekiah and said, welcome the new king. <coughs> Probably they had the conferences in the back room say, how are we going to get rid of these Babylonians? Mm -hmm. So Jeremiah say, pops up and says... You're not going to. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Jeremiah's message was pretty simple and straightforward. Serve the king of Babylon. As God tells you to, and you will live in your country, and your city will be preserved. Jeremiah 27, read it through. He said that even the nations would be preserved, and their farmers would be able to continue farming their, their properties. Jeremiah begged each of his audiences not to be deceived by false prophets. Zedekiah was the last king to serve Judah, and he did so during that terrible siege. Through two and a half, three years, you're locked up inside a small city with walls, waiting for that big old army to conquer you. As things got worse and worse, Zedekiah called Jeremiah secret to hear what God might have to say to him. Look at these words from Ellen White describing what had happened. There was still opportunity for the king to reveal a willingness to, hear, to heed the warnings of Jehovah and thus to temper with mercy the judgments even now falling on city and nation. If thou wilt assuredly go forth unto the king of Babylon's princess, was the message given to the king, then thy soul shall live, and this city shall not be burned with fire, and thou shalt live in thine house. But if thou wilt not go forth to the king of Babylon's princess, then shall thy, this city be given into the hand of the Chaldeans, and they shall, be burnt, they shall burn it with fire, and thou shalt not escape out of their hand. The king was too weak to follow Jeremiah's advice, and I don't have time to read the rest of it down there. But he would have had ample support if he had stood up faithfully for God's, God's side, and Judah would have been spared the untold woe of carnage and famine and fire and the destruction of Solomon's temple. Okay, so we've had the example of Jeremiah. We've talked about it. How do we, in our day, choose between who's telling us the truth and who isn't? Our kind and wonderful Father, we certainly have been given adequate warning. may not always be easy. The devil is going to do everything possible to make it difficult for us to distinguish between the truth and error. We need to be warned. We thank you for your word, which has spelled out the truth. And if we can understand it clearly and precisely, we will never be deceived. And that may, may that be our experience as our prayer in Jesus' name.